In Iceland, they have money that only 300,000 people accept as real money. You can take your money and go somewhere else and nobody accepts it for anything. It's just not legal tender anywhere except on this volcanic island in the middle of the Atlantic. The EVE money is exactly the same. It's only legal tender inside Demon Line, but it has a bigger audience using it. So this is kind of the context of money. I mean, we have foreign trade and exchanges between Iceland and, and other countries, which are sometimes extremely problematic when we have the backing bubble of 2007 and the collapse of 2008. There was a lot of interest arbitrage between the Japanese yen over to Icelandic krona because Icelandic krona is high interest rate, Japanese yen is low interest rate. Okay, you take out yen loans, you buy ISK, you sell bonds to Icelandic companies, etc. And this was popped into a bubble that was 14 times the economy. And then it all came tumbling down because Iceland couldn't underwrite all this inflated economic value at the heart of it. The money in Iceland is not valid except it is in Iceland. And just because people were taking yens and, and issuing debt in Iceland at high yield didn't become real. It just wasn't real at all. So the, the money in Ima Line is kind of exactly the same. So excited to be here at GDC and having an absolute legend in uh, our A16Z pop-up studio, let's just call it that, um, Hilmar Peterson, CEO, founder of CCP Games. Uh, I started this podcast, I'm like, I have a million questions to ask you and we're going to need like 20 hours. So mm -hmm. I'm going to consistently try to reel back the amount of stuff I want to pull out of your brain. Um, but yeah, it's exciting to have you off the heels of a very big announcement this week, mm -hmm. talking to us. Uh, we'll go into that a little bit later, but what... I was curious, like, how many GDCs have you been to at this this point already? So uh, I went to GDC for the first time in the year 2000, yeah. um, and that was quite an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. That actually, I think, was the first time I had seen a game developer, an actual one. Um, <laughs> uh, in Iceland, this was the first game for all of us. Yeah. Nobody had made a game. So when I come to GDC, I'm at least seeing a game developer game developer from afar. It's real. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually meet Martin Takahashi yeah. uh, in the hallway there. And uh, it was kind of a chance encounter, but uh, me and Dean have kind of been in this industry yeah. for a long time. Uh, but then we were in a death march shipping in Im online and uh, reinforcing the servers for the next couple of years. So then I didn't go until 2005 for the second time. Mm. And since then, I think I've mm. been to everyone. Wow. It's wow. crazy. I'd, I'd love to actually start um, maybe even before that because uh, you've been in games for so long now, uh, but yeah. how did you all get started um, and what kind of got you into games from the, from the very beginning? Um, so it probably starts when I'm nine years old. Then I see <laughs> uh, an ad for a Sinclair Spectrum um, in like uh, an Icelandic newspaper. And uh, I had never seen a computer. I didn't know what computers were. I didn't know anyone but I had to have one. Um, <laughs> and my parents weren't like, didn't have the money just to go and buy a computer. Mm. So I started to do a paper route and I did a paper route okay. until I had saved up 6,450 <coughs> ISK to go the next town over to buy a Sinclair Spectrum. Oh man. Uh, then I have a Sinclair Spectrum. This, this is your first startup, your first entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah, this, yeah, this I, I was, <laughs> I was uh, earning, uh, <laughs> the money to, to buy the, the, right. the first asset of sorts. So um, then I have the computer and I have my parents' black and white TV and an English dictionary because nobody spoke English in my household <laughs> and not me. And then I'm kind of figuring out how to connect it up to the TV and then uh, figuring out how to type in programs on the rubber keys. You put the computer into the TV. Yeah, you. Th that's how it worked. You were connecting computers. I'm, into I'm the... dating myself. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. had to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this was like a black and white tube TV. I was connecting the Sinclair Spectrum in there. Then I was buying computer ma mm -hmm. game magazines, typing on the rubber keys. Oh my First, God. just simple programs and then later games, which I started to mod. And, and uh, I've been doing that ever since. Wow. That is a great story. And what was the first video game that you played that, you, that captured your imagination? So um, the first video game was... Um, I think it came with a Sinclair Spectrum. It was kind okay. of this, uh, where you have the ball bouncing on the wall and you have the little slat. Um, and that was the first game I modded. <laughs> so 
Mm. Like I figured out how to make the sled just a lot bigger, so the game was a lot easier. <laughs> and man, did that feel <laughs> some could say mod, other people could say cheat, uh, or you know, <laughs> this was, was the first cheat code. Yeah, it was totally modding. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and that was my first ever kind of modding of a game. I feel like we're seeing all of these signals of what you would eventually build, right? Because yes. you were in the computers, you were entrepreneurial, you were in the modding, and then that would eventually culminate into you joining the technology industry, right? So yeah. Yeah. And what, what was Iceland at the time like for game development? Or I have to imagine there was no community of other devs. In uh, uh, no, well, there was a bit of a community of people um, kind of typing stuff on the Sinclair Spectrum. And later the Amiga, like the Amiga was like quite the community in Iceland. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was obviously like taking the cassettes and, and, and duplicating them and mm -hmm. doing all that because they were so hard to get any content. Yeah. Iceland was not big on the map for anyone. Yeah. So somebody just finding a game, like mm -hmm. it was like the, the only way was to duplicate it kind of in the community. Um, so th so there was a bit of a searing scene around that mm -hmm. and, and people were more doing demos kind of yeah. as kind of maybe the Finns have the world record in that scene. But there was a tiny demo scene in, in Iceland where people mm -hmm. were kind of doing demos on the Amiga. Um, and uh, and then later on, a company is founded in Iceland called Ors Interactive. It was founded in '92, um, and uh, I joined that company in '96. And that company was making a social VRML browser, where you could basically take VRML files made by anyone. You could load them up into the browser. You could fly around, and you could make avatars, and you could meet other people. There was <laughs> voice or write P. You could like dress them up. You could do whatever. It was basically wow. the metaverse. Um, we even, I think, uh, Internet World 98, we had like an Icelandic singer on stage wearing a mocap suit, like a magnetic mocap suit, very wow. complicated to do on the stage. And she was like performing and singing to thousands of people on the internet <clears throat> in 98 in VRML, full 3D captured and wow. broadcast. And uh, we kind of found out like, okay, this was maybe 50 years too early and nobody really needed it. Uh -huh. So ultimately the story of CCP is that we wanted to make something practical after having made that. And oh, practical to us was okay. making a single sharded space ML. Mm. And the and the early and the vision, the mission statement for CCP, which you you coined at the very beginning, was to make virtual worlds as meaningful as those in real life, right? And yeah. So um that mission statement is formalized in 2008. So mm -hmm. um, uh, before that, uh, we had a lot of phrases which inspired Eve Online. One key phrase was, death is a serious matter. Mm -hmm. If it looks good, it is good. There, there were these kind of uh -huh. phrases which went into the creation of Eve. And then once Eve had kind of taken a life on its own, we were often sort of retroactively trying to figure out exactly what it is, because uh, I think Eve is still in many ways unprecedented. It's kind of a category unto mm -hmm. itself. Um, and then we were also doing all these kind of company values and sort of the Jim Collins kind of good to great sort of mythology. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he has this importance of codifying the core purpose. And when we were doing that, we came up with this thing of like, we want to make virtual worlds more meaningful than real life. And there's a big debate still in the company. Should it be more meaningful, as meaningful, mm. etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. um, and 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 we went for more, as meaningful. Uh, doesn't seem. I mean, in even in the world today, maybe like a tall order. Uh, mm -hmm. Reality has many, many problems as we're mm -hmm. seeing on clear display mm -hmm. right now. And obviously, we're not trying to surplant people's like relationships with their friends and children, etc. But right. their real life is a lot not about that. A real life is a lot about buying a house that's too expensive. So you constantly have to be aware to pay your markets and you never see your kids and family because you're on a hamster wheel of the Western economy. And like, <laughs> man, God, we, we must be able to do better than that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just find that um, it was fascinating that this was 1997 or 98 when you started the company, right? And um, you had already you already had the vision to kind of see that virtual worlds were going to be a thing um, that many, many people in the future would be interested in. And I have to assume that was not obvious at the time, right? This was before the internet was like widely, you know, available and accessible to everyone around the world. And this was before definitely VR was popular and 
um, you know, many of the things that we associate with like the metaverse or like, you know, today, like just haven't come into existence yet. And, you know, blockchain is definitely one of one of our then. So um, I just Hilmar's going to tell you they were, though. Yeah. And you're going to be like, what? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it 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 didn't really feel like something mm -hmm. profound. It just felt kind of obvious. I mean, a lot of us were either playing MUDs or playing Ultima Online. Right. Um, and if you participate in a MUD just because it's just made out of text, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of composability, there's a lot of like um, kind of world creation that, that happens in those worlds. Social mm -hmm. dynamics. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. and especially when it was just text only, you really felt the power of you can just create the world and mm -hmm. other people want to come and live in it. Um, so, I mean, the rest has really just been updating the graphics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, well, you could see all the early kind of all this element about like players making their own worlds and kind of composability and, compose and all these things. Mm -hmm. That was all full display with MUDs as like, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I joined my first MUD in 92. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. so I mean, once you had gotten the taste of that, it was just like, okay, then make your graphics. Yeah. Doesn't seem very complicated. Mm -hmm. I mean, it turned out it was a bit complicated, but... Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's really only what we have been doing ever right. since. It's just yeah. updating the graphics. That's amazing. Uh, maybe let's um, let's spend a bit of time going deeper in the EVE Online. You know, today people refer to it as the closest thing that we have to the metaverse, right? It's an epic sci-fi MMO where there's an open economy and millions of players are playing and some people make a living in the game and others have, you know, have very rich social lives, uh, but maybe just to frame it for the audience here, just tell us a bit about the, the scale and the scope of, of EVE. Like how many people play, what do they do, uh, yeah. what's the size of the economy, how, yeah. how does it all work, so on. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, the, the premise of EVE is that there are roughly 7,000 solar systems which are laid out on a map with a very deliberate topology to them. And the topology is codified with, with Stargate connections between the different solar systems. So that provides like a tapestry on which the, the world enact itself. Um, and because the, the map is of limited size and uh, resources are asymmetrically distributed throughout the map, uh, the thesis was long once we have a lot of people come onto that map, they need to acquire resources to build bigger spaceships and space stations and, and things like that. Then cooperation and conflict will be will emerge uh, mainly due to the asymmetry of the resource distribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, nobody right. can be fully autonomous and also nobody can fully on their own amass all the resources needed to build the, the biggest things. Mm. Um, and the biggest things in EVE Online are kind of titans and citadels. Uh, EVE players have gotten extraordinarily good at the logistics. So <laughs> these are battleships or these are large yeah, ships? Yeah, Titan is like a city of size. Like mm. um, a Titan is like the size of San Francisco. A citadel is like uh, almost like a size of a small U.S. state. Um, so these are very big things, and mm -hmm. they need multiple minerals and mm -hmm. and moon materials and materials all from the world. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of effort needed to gather together the materials mm -hmm. to build the thing. Then the thing needs to be operated, defended against other people. Right. That also gives you economic leverage once you build the infrastructure. Yeah. So the idea is that you start alone. You're in a little spaceship. Right. Uh, you want a bigger spaceship and very quickly you figure out, okay, to get anywhere, I need to cooperate with others. Right. So you join a corporation, you climb up the ranks, you maybe take over the corporation, you join an alliance, mm -hmm. and then you're vying for world dominations for decades to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this has been running now since May, 7th of May, no, 6th of May, <laughs> uh, 2003. It's turning Crazy. 20 now in May. Mm -hmm. uh, about 20 million people have played the game throughout this period. Wow. Um, the uh, monthly active user base, as we count the old version of EVE Online, like we have a PC uh, version, which is kind of a global version. We have two Chinese PC versions. Then we have a mobile version, which is um, uh, global, and then a Chinese mobile version. So mm -hmm. there are like about five SKUs of EVE Online. Mm -hmm. um, MAU is sort of between one and two and uh, aggregate across all these queues. Then uh, if we found the biggest vanity metric, then uh, 60 million emails have touched that whole thing, <laughs> which uh, I don't think fully equates to, <coughs> to 60 million people having played, yeah. but mm -hmm. like 
attributing emails to people is is an uh, is a science unto itself. And right. it's a it's a single server. It's like a dynamic server too, right? Where everything's going on all the time. It's yeah. Not so sharded or yeah. so the main server which runs out of London um, is a uh, exactly that. It's a it's a server where uh, everyone that is playing on that server, and though that can be hundreds of thousands of people, can meet each other, can affect each other, mm -hmm. shares the same economy, and that is by far the the biggest unique part of even line is the shard is very big. Yeah. It's orders of magnitude bigger than any any other sort of gaming shards or gaming servers. That's not how it started though, like right in 2003, was it always as big as it was or did that kind of scale and evolve with uh, the growth of the community and whatnot? Um, so the, the context into which the game is released is a bit interesting. So we had been toiling away on the game, uh, running out of money, working without salary and, and God knows what. And, um, <laughs> and we sell the publishing rights to the to a US company um, kind of midway through to kind of get money to finish uh, finish the game. Um, that company actually decided to close down their games and interactive software division. So, uh, but there were a few games in channel, actually there were 30,000 boxes of Eve Online somewhere in gaming <laughs> stores around the world. Uh -huh. So there was like this sort of global ARG game of finding the Eve boxes yeah. to scratch off the codes to get into the game because we were not allowed to uh, offer the game free on the internet because we had sold the publishing rights. Mm -hmm. So, and it took us like uh, six months to uh, renegotiate wow. the publishing rights back. Uh -huh. So there was kind of a hard limit of 30,000 people playing him online for the first six months. And it did require somebody finding a box. So uh, first <laughs> boxes were first found and then people were scouring it's the like the golden ticket in Willy yeah, Wonka, like, you had to go like, around. <laughs> it was like the golden ticket. Yeah. So, and then people had like uh, it's the IRC servers to share the CD keys and, and, and whatnot. Wow. So there was this interesting sort of accidental velvet rope right. uh, that right. actually really helped us uh, patching up the servers because the, 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 right. the, 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 the <laughs> it was a bit of an impossibility <laughs> to have like single sharded MMO running on like 386s, yeah. uh, which we had to, uh, yeah. like no, we, <laughs> not 386s, we had Pentium 3s. We had Pentium 3s to <laughs> run as the server chips. Uh, <laughs> so there was a lot of optimization we did during that era that kind of, I think, helped a lot. Mm -hmm. We've been optimizing the servers ever since. But, uh, but for the six months, there was kind of a hard cap. Okay. And how did you, um, I think one of the things that most MMOs today struggle with, and we've seen it with like New World and Lost Ark and, and, and the most recent batch of MMOs that co have come on the market is just solving the code start problem, right? Mm -hmm. You have an empty server, you have worlds where like there's all this content and beautiful stuff created, and no one's playing. And then it's kind of a chicken and egg problem because I only want to play if the two of you are playing and mm -hmm. then, you know, so on and so forth. But how did you guys solve that with the yeah. initial so release? this accident with the boxes and the 30,000 cap mm -hmm. in a way helped the game a lot because uh, that initial cohort of 30,000 people had like six months to build the social infrastructure to onboard the next wave. Mm. So often the problem with new wave mm -hmm. MMOs, which are built around sometimes, but not always a form of social emergence is that there needs to be like a hierarchy to the community. So it's a little bit like a school system. Mm. If you only have six-year-olds, you have one gigantic six-year-old right. class, right. and you don't have seven, eight, nine, and ten. Right. So you don't really have a pipeline right. of different cohorts that kind of work together to create, the, in this case, an even line to create the universe. Mm -hmm. So, so the fact that the game had kind of an opportunity to build a bit of its initial social infrastructure with this kind of accidental velvet rope entry due to the boxes then made it such that when people started to come in, they were meeting an infrastructure that could onboard them. So that, I think, helped a lot that we didn't have this kind of people rushing in, nothing really works because uh, there mm -hmm. is no infrastructure, and then people not wanting to be around for that. Mm -hmm. We always had the reverse. We kind of grew steadily um, mm -hmm. uh, up, to the, up to the kind of, up to the scale it is at now. So, Interesting. So to, to take it a little further too, uh, another kind of thing that um, restrains MMOs, like modern MMOs, is the players are just too smart and they're too good and they climb through and burn through the content too fast and the yeah. end game appears too quickly 
and to try to get ahead of the content pipeline at the end game scenario becomes like a another bottleneck in itself where newer companies might not have the money or time to develop enough content to match that point like yeah did you run into any of that or was that mostly because it was so socially engineered to have so many experiences that you didn't have to worry as much about the um deep progression so um we did have to have that problem we actually did it for a we did have that problem for a different reason but let, let's park that a bit uh, because pe the the game is so much about the economy and other people competing and cooperating um that the game more auto balances itself because the content of the game are things that player, players create. Mm -hmm. Players are creating corporations. They are recruiting people into the corporations. The corporations have a janta to oh. occupy territory. Mm -hmm. They're in constant ebb and flow with all the corporation taking their territory away and all of that ebbing and flowing. Mm -hmm. That becomes like, as we often call it, like the infinitely scalable storytelling engine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That people are really making their own adventure, telling their own stories. So we don't have to as much be introducing yeah. storylines and content etc and most of what they're doing is composing the world to their will but mm -hmm. we did have a problem with the content treadmill because we had designed the game such we have meticulously calculated the sizes of cargo holds the distance to star uh, to asteroid belts to space stations what was the potential yield of a spaceship over time we had like uh, a lot of excel sheets calculating this meticulously then the the players found a debug feature in the game uh which wasn't supposed to be there is that uh, for debugging purposes you could like eject something from your cargo hold and a cargo container spawned around it and that stayed in space for an hour this was something put in the game for debugging purposes but players found that if you placed such a container group of people were mining into the container and somebody was doing the hauling back and forth mm -hmm. they could vastly leverage uh, how many minerals they could hmm. acquire from an asteroid field to a space station. Hmm. And and we were so busy just like making the game work, we didn't really find out about this mm -hmm. until three months after the release, people were already in battleships. And it was supposed to take people up to three years to get to the battleships. <laughs> but due to this usage <laughs> of this debug feature, they were able to yield a lot more mineral, mineral production yeah. than we had ever calculated. Right. So, so we were faced like, okay, should we take this out, this right. invented gameplay? And we decided to leave it in because this was frankly a better way to play the game than what we had designed it as. Right. Because there was a trust dynamic between the people mining and the people hauling. Co-reliance on Yeah, yes. Yeah. You have to trust the person that takes mm -hmm. the minerals that they're actually going to put it in the corporate hangar and not their own hangar. And there's trust from the people involved in this mm -hmm. that everyone is honestly putting all their mineral into right. the share container. <laughs> So that's a really key point. That's like a Oppenheimer kind of decision of like, do you let it go or do you, you know, yes. it's like a very like critical yeah, you, like, decision. Yes. There, there have been many things in email line, which are a little bit like a test to our conviction on it, really, because mm -hmm. they're legit. People had broken the game. They were doing in three months what should have ha happened in three years. And we decided to put uh, to have it in there because it was a better way to play the game. Mm -hmm. It was a better implementation yeah. of the principles of Evil 9, relying on cooperation based on trust in an open yeah. setting where there are no guarantees by the system. And, um, and here we are. That's mm. fascinating. I think it's a, great, um, it's a great testament to your trust in the community. Um, and also, I think, a very decentralized way of actually pursuing game development, because I think the opposite approach is actually, you know, some game companies out there, there's a singular person, the game director who has, who's a creative auteur. They know everything that's supposed to happen in the game and if anything deviates from it, boom, it, like they, they mm -hmm. constrain it back to that singular vision, right? But in your case, many things happen which the original developers did not anticipate and then yeah. you ran along with it, trusted the community and then just tried to make sure things didn't fall too too far off the guardrails. Right? Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, ever since day one, we were always talking about the emergence. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to build atomic components, which are going to be composed by players into something yeah. new. So when we look at this can debug feature, it's being composed into a new way to do the mining. Now it's a social endeavor. It used mm -hmm. to be a solo endeavor. It is just like, okay, here are players right. composing tools in the universe. Even right. if this tool was an accidental debug tool, in a way yeah. where they have created out of the 
atomics of the digital physics of the world a better way than what we had envisioned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so why I would agree it was kind of maybe unorthodox to lean into that. That was always the intent to mm-hmm. uh, to yeah. allow for these kind of things to happen. Yeah. And and then I mean a horde of examples have ensued since then where players have found extremely innovative ways to to play the game in a way that mm-hmm. nobody really ever foresee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To go back to the virtual worlds um you know uh thesis, I yeah. think that it's interesting that a resource based game where you create social structures of dependence and codependence between different classes of players um is almost in some ways more meaningful than re- like if I were to buy into that thesis it's like more interesting because <coughs> there's no actual financial incentive for those players uh like real world financial incentive it's just like we're harvesting resources in a digital world to help one another to build a digital you know um battleship or yeah. citadel eventually it's kind of just magical to see that like all these things can emerge when there's no actual like reward outside of what exists in the game and what you can give players what's intrinsic motivation right yep like there yeah i mean it's both intrinsic and extrinsic because the money in the economy of e online has a lot of contextual value to the people playing e online mm-hmm. i mean e online player base is bigger than that of iceland iceland has its own currency mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> it's called the isk like the e currency mm-hmm. it's a bit of a Childish joke of ours to yeah. do to do that. Interstellar currency, right? Yeah, interstellar yeah. credits with credits a K with because K, yeah. it's cool. Um, and the other one stands for Icelandic krona. Um, so in Iceland, there are people that live on an island. They have uh, money that only three hundred thousand people accept as real money. You can take your money and go somewhere else, and nobody accepts it for anything. It's just not legal tender anywhere except on this uh, on this volcanic island in the middle of the Atlantic. Only this money is 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 valuable there. The eat money is exactly the same. It's only illegal tender inside the online. Yeah. Um, but it has a bigger audience using it mm-hmm. than the than the fish money <laughs> of Iceland. Right. Mm. Twenty million players. Yeah. So yeah. so the the this is kind of the context of of money. And then obviously then I mean we have foreign trade and exchanges between Iceland and and other countries which are sometimes extremely problematic when we had the backing bubble of 2007 and the collapse of 2008. Iceland was kind of, there was a lot of interest arbitrage between the Japanese yen over to Icelandic krona because Icelandic krona is high interest rate, Japanese yen is low interest rate. Okay, you take out yen loans, you buy ISK, you sell bonds to Icelandic companies, etc. And this was pumped into a bubble that was 14 times the economy. And then it all came tumbling down because Iceland couldn't underwrite all this inflated economic value. So, I mean, this was because at the heart of it, the money in Iceland is not valid, except it is in Iceland. And just because people were taking yens and, and mm-hmm. issuing mm-hmm. debt in Iceland at yeah. high yield didn't, right. mm-hmm. didn't become real. Mm-hmm. It just yeah. wasn't real at all. Right. So the, the money in Ima line is kind of exactly the same. Right. Yeah. I think it's a great remind. I think it's a great reminder that literally currencies are a human invention where yeah. it only has value because other people believe it has value and, and so on and so forth. And so yeah. the d- difference between digital and sort of um, you know physical tender is, is actually yeah. um, just and, like and, constructive and, 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 and it is built around an extremely unique human trait, which is labor specialization. Money started to exist to arbitrate mm-hmm. specialization of labor. Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. I can only do this thing and you can do that thing and you can do this thing, mm-hmm. us composing trade between us on a unit basis of like, you know how to build houses, mm-hmm. I know how to grow sheep, you know how to grow corn. Like, it's a very complicated right. multi-party transaction. Which one's the most important? Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and how, right. how do you compose <laughs> partial houses to partial wheat to partial yeah, sheep? Right. Yeah. Right. And thus, currency were in, in implemented to compose specialized labor into economic units that could build uh, amazing things. Mm-hmm. Um, coupled with mostly bureaucracies, that's kind of how like people yeah. built pyramids and went to space. Right. Mm. And and give us a sense of um I guess the scale of the Eve online economy. Because I, I think that's yeah. I've heard some pretty impressive metrics in terms of items created and um just like the dollar value that's of transactions and so on and so forth. Yeah. So um we in two thousand and nine introduced a, a fairly unique um element into the game called Plex. Mm-hmm. Uh and it's inspired by the African cell phone minute economy. 
Okay. So many uh, African countries operate on the on the basis where the where the currency system is cell phone minutes. Time. Yeah, it's yeah. basically you can redeem the currency for goods and services of a telephone company. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you live in an economy that's very volatile, it's good to have a currency that has a, a redemption to something. Mm-hmm. When currencies were tied to gold uh, bars or something like that, you had the redemption path. Our currency systems are no longer like that. And then they become volatile and they become volatiles in emerging markets mm-hmm. of which Africa is full of. So for the longest time, and I think even still today, they used African cell phone minutes. So uh, we implemented this concept called Plax, which you can redeem for uh, uh, the subscription um, uh, status in the online. Mm-hmm. So it's basically one Plax was one month. Mm-hmm. We have since divided the Plax into finer grains because it was kind of cumbersome when you were just had one Plax one month kind of a thing. So as soon as we did this, we in a way started to develop an exchange rate between the ISK and Email Line to the Plex, mm. and then by recourse to the to the minting of the Plex through dollars. Mm. You pay CCP dollars, you get that Plex, and then you give the Plex to somebody else and get the ISK. So then this established idea of like what does an ISK cost uh, started to emerge in a more formal way. Before that, it was all gray market real money trades, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. was hard to keep track of. But at least there we have like a gold standard of what is the value of the right. of the currency. Mm-hmm. And then we started to be able to quantify like what a big space buffer in Neon Line. Mm-hmm. What is the value, the economic value of the spaceship equipment that is destroyed in a battle? Mm-hmm. And this kind of reached its pinnacle at some point in, I think it's 2014, mm-hmm. where Eve holds the record in, uh, yes. in the biggest destruction of the virtual Guinness value. World record. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Guinness Book, right? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. in the Guinness Book of World Records. So for a period of lasting, I think, 24 hours, Eve players destroyed $300,000 worth of spaceship equipment. Mm-hmm. Through this kind of path, then we started to, to kind of quantify that. Yeah. And that there, we started to more and more sort of talk about the economy of Eve Online in sort of, approximate country terms do you did you like when that like obviously that's a pretty insane player-led decision to will, willingly put that much at stake yeah. um and when those battles happened like what was like what was the reaction from you and the rest of the team like was that expected was that out of nowhere so these large battles which are an, another invention by if players like we foresaw people maybe a few hundred people fight uh, in a in a in a in a fleet that was something we we maybe talked about during the design stages but thousands of people was like unfathomable mm-hmm. and it did take people uh, or players up to like 10 years to get to a thousand thousands of people uh waging flea fights to lose and, it in 24 hours and uh, yeah, well, they usually play out in 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 a few days. Mm-hmm. Uh, these kind of large war engagement, and and it's important to note, like the social organization, to build all these spaceships, orchestrate them onto the battlefield, and then get the army to show up on time mm-hmm. and be in formations and 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 all those things, is an an extraordinarily amount of like human logistics feat. Mm-hmm. I mean, try organizing a children's party, just having <laughs> people show up on time, like, and you're, you're right. talking 20 kids. Right. It's yeah. like right. nigh impossible. Getting yeah. thousands of people from all across the globe yeah. come and, 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 and after with hard to earn assets onto the battlefield mm-hmm. to resolve conflict between two major empires. This is military logistics, just like yeah. we see, yeah. like par excellence. Just like in the real world. And yeah. if players, like, trained and trained and trained in this. So we saw these fights grow and grow and grow to the point where they're now like the biggest one was like somewhere north of 8,000 people fighting at the same time. And we have been ever since finding the server capacity to simulate this all correctly. This mm. is a lot. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, and we're always in this kind of race of like, we have people optimizing the servers. Every time we opt- optimize the servers, more people pile in. and It's like opening up another freeway lane where it doesn't actually solve <laughs> yeah, the problem. It, yes, it's, it's, it's a bit <laughs> like, like that. Yeah. Yeah. But and the, was the goal territory in that battle? It was like taking over another faction, but was the ultimate goal taking over more 
uh, like another uh, territory. It was like space. At the at the heart of it, the 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 game is a territory conquest game. Territory conquest. Yeah. Yeah, but there are also a lot of human emotions that get mixed in. Like there is a lot of uh, uh, ego-driven reasons for why people are uh, engaging in this fight. Sometimes fights are even orchestrated just because uh, it's fun. Like uh, yep. the mm -hmm. the sometimes the 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 people just want to exercise yeah. their wonder, powers. You wonder if you can take on that ship. Yeah, so, or or yeah. or that alliance. There is yeah. actually right now there's a war brewing or has been brewing. I am kind of out of the loop as I've been here at TDC. But uh, there, there are exciting things. What's yeah. this space in EVE Online right now where where there's been a bubbling underneath uh, a pretty big yeah. sort of conflict? I, I think it's fascinating that uh, what is your, what, what do you see your role as a developer when mm. all of these things are happening, right? And so kind of a corollary to, to Lester's question, like are you actively managing like the, the kind of the, the political theater or do you like intervene if some things get out of hand and also like economically i imagine there must be you know opportunities where you could have as a developer been the central bank for example so how, how, how do you as the developer manage all these things that happen yeah uh, so i mean our biggest role is um, in some way managing the economy um, mm -hmm. and it's uh, um um it's a bit of an unfortunate role. Like the the way that things enter and exit even online mm -hmm. is uh, is pretty good. Um, I mean, it's it, we are here 20 years later, but it also wasn't designed to run for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like the, the when we were designing the the inputs and the outputs of the economy, uh, we we were, I mean, we were 27. When you're 27, like three years is eternity. <laughs> so so the the there is this aspect of like the game was procedurally generated, but the world does not have it, its own ability to procedurally regenerate itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the 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 mineral distribution, etc., is very rigid. It's all very sort of mechanical. It's all very deterministic, and players are really uh, smart in in spotting. Uh, the deterministic patterns that are underneath. So they find these staple solves where they're able, in a similar way as with the mining into the jet cans, uh, get a lot more minerals than the game is designed for. Mm -hmm. And then the economy goes out of whack because most of the economy then destroys things through, mm -hmm. through war. Mm -hmm. So the game is overly <laughs> reliant on the fact that it is kind of deterministically reseating all all its resources, players are super quick at understanding how that works. They amass up a lot of assets, and then the 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 war of attrition of those assets is not enough to com compete with players' ability to understand the the patterns. Hmm. So we have had to do a lot of sort of manual intervention mm -hmm. into how the mineral distribution and acquisition and all that works. I see. So sometimes we have had to run like almost like scarcity periods to kind of uh, deflate the economy to a reasonable level, and we're just yeah. kind of coming out of a uh, out of one. This is the equivalent of controlling the money supply because they're. Printing. So this is actually the equivalent of of like controlling the uranium distribution on planet Earth, or okay. like where is crude oil on planet Earth. This mm. is more like that. The natural okay. resources. Yeah, the natural resources of the world don't really uh, have the ability to procedurally regenerate itself to be in a, almost like a dialogue with the populace of the world on how the resources uh, become scarce and shift around and deplete, etc. Uh, and, and if I were to have like a magic wand and, and, um, and do something with Eve, I, I would find the way to, to make the, the, the game behave even more like nature mm. by sort mm. of procedurally regenerating itself in a way that would be surprising to us and surprising to players. Mm. I keep on having to pinch myself to, to be like, are we talking about real world or uh, the game when, when I, we talk I know. about these the, philosophies? The, the, it's, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <you> know, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it, um, it's like we can't regenerate fossil fuels. It's like the equivalent of that, right? Yes. right. Yeah. So there right. are equivalents in the world. Yeah. Uh, the world's obviously a little bit richer in you know, things, but yeah, yeah, but but the 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 scarcity of resources 
and the technology innovation level that is needed to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And oil is a really good example. First, we were taking it from the surface and it was almost just like coming out of the ground on its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now people need like extremely high tech equipment to get kind of the last drenches of oil that are still left. Um, And that actually is like those kind of technology innovation leaps uh, are are very useful MMO game design mechanics. And especially if you allow people to even invent it on their own, Mm. which is doable through kind of social composability. But again, going back to Eve, the fact that it is rather deterministic and it doesn't really deplete and you don't really have to reach deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm. Uh, kind of it it then lacks this beauty that is in the uh, mm-hmm. depleting resource model that we have on planet Earth. Uh, mm-hmm. Should we like that's like a perfect segue for to talk about the technologies of today and like, you know, when you say you w- wave the magic wand, what would you do better in a you know, different kind of Eve universe? Like I feel that well initially it was it was servers and it was um, processing speeds and you know, that was like a tech, that was like an innovation that allowed for more kinds of gameplay, um, you know, decades have passed, two decades have passed since the game has come out. And now we're at a point, you know, days after kind of, you know, our announcement and, and looking to forward yeah. in the future of EVE, like what technology do you see right now is potentially opening up more chapters of like the EVE universe? So I, I think um, it's both technologies, but it's mostly techniques, mm-hmm. uh, uh, which is also important to realize like design techniques to address some of the things we have observed about eve which if you had the time machine i would go and change those initial contextions it's actually more techniques than it is technology okay. uh, the like in terms of technology sure we have faster cpus sure we have uh, different programming mm-hmm. languages etc <laughs> but like nothing really materially has changed maybe some of the ai stuff is materially different mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's still very early days mm-hmm. uh, Right. But but these techniques, um, I would I would think a lot about that, uh, especially like all this deterministic behavior in the base layer of human line. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we look at our own reality, everything is prob- probabilities, right. like right. shockingly so and irritatingly so. When you look at the quantum world, <coughs> it's right. like mind boggingly like probability, uh, right. kind of like yep. and everything and we look well. at is probability based. And right. Eve is just too t- deterministic. And and the probability patterns and the probability distributions that we could employ, and especially with like a shifting kind of resource landscape, almost like a weather, becomes just a fundamentally more interesting world to crack the code mm-hmm. uh, rather than what we have in Eve, which is fairly regimented, deterministic, mm-hmm. and uh, and predictable. And predictability brings boredom at some, at some right. point. So that is one. I would make the world a lot more probabilistic. We have some probabilistic outcomes in email line, largely in a concept that is called wormholes. Immediately, people are creating gods. Like, Eve mm-hmm. players have created a god. It's called Bob. Uh, it controls the probability uh, distribution of where wormholes appear and appear and how they're rolled out and down. Uh, and, 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 if players exist in a very interesting time uh, dynamic with their own god creation where it's both a joke and also not a joke uh, <laughs> and it's usually uh, mm-hmm. when you're creating gods to get sense of controlling your environment that is like mankind at its peak mm-hmm. like this mm-hmm. is what we do <clears throat> when right. we're faced with an enigma that needs uh, the invention of a god to explain right. Right. So building a world that it is imbued with properties which are so deeply interesting mm. that you 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 enter into this domain is the high bar of virtual world creation. Uh, and we have seen from experimentation with Eve and l- learning from Eve players also, like making a world that's way more built on these principles will be a much bigger enigma to crack. So that's number one. Uh, number two uh, is that the EVE material economy is pretty interesting. So acquire resources, compose into modules, take modules, build spaceships, take spaceships, mine some more, build space stations. But this is all a material economy. We we, we have attempted many times to add like energy to it. I could take the example of a a thing called strontium that was for a period of time used in EVE Online to power certain types of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And we're always looking for ways 
to create that design space where the scarcity function is not only time. Uh, and when you have this, it does not cost any energy to acquire minerals. The only scarcity is the amount of time you have. And that leads to an obvious outcome, which I'm going to call agency stacking. Uh, and just to explain the language a bit, so agency is your ability to affect the world. If I can stack my agency, I can multiply myself, mm -hmm. either because I'm playing many clients at the same time, or I am having parts of the clients I'm running played by robots. There's no downside. It's always better just to stack to your agency. To have more and more yeah. and more. Yeah. It's better to have more. This creates a perpetual problem in EVE Online where we're fighting bots. Yeah. Uh, and we want to fight bots because we want it to be valuable to be human playing the game. We don't want the game to be about like programming bots. We want the game to be about playing the game. And in the absence of energy being con consumed by actions in the world, you only have time. So adding energy on top of these probabilistic outcomes gives a focused human mind a chance to always win against, against bots. Hmm. Interesting. And, and and this is something profound and fundamental in taking us decades to really sort of hone in on these. So 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 these two things, if I were to just wave a magic wand and change these two things in email line, and I would have to go to the beginning because you can't really change these initial conditions mm -hmm. on year 20, that would be some of the techniques I would take with myself to create another one. That's awesome. So, so maybe we can dive a bit deeper into the blockchain because I know that's the, the hot topic of the week with the yep. announcement of Project Awakening. Um, and it's been described as a AAA title set in the EVE universe, mm -hmm. leveraging sort of blockchain technology. And so I feel like you kind of hit on a number of points over the course of you know, the last answer that you just gave. But let me just ask it very directly. And this is sort of what I'm seeing and on Reddit these days. The, the big question is, how does leveraging blockchain technology actually make for a better game? Yeah, so there are a few elements where mm -hmm. I could like hand to heart say it's, uh, it's a better substrate to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Number one is there's a lot of third party development around the online. Mm -hmm. It largely takes place through an API gateway. Mm -hmm. So we have a database, which is our persistent storage then we have the ability to access that persistent storage through an API gateway, mm -hmm. with, which is kind of controlled by keys. And if you have the keys, you can sort of execute on behalf mm -hmm. of another person and you can kind of get through the API and get right. to the data and compose the data, etc. Right. Currently, we don't really allow many reads through this system. It's really only writes. And, and the reason why we mm -hmm. are kind of at that level is uh, because this pattern uh, is quite powerful. But it does have limitations about like metering the amount of execution you can do, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so smart contract blockchains actually are a pretty good model where people could create third party code that runs coexisting with other third party code mm -hmm. under this sort of gas sort of economy that exists on blockchains. Mm -hmm. And that helps with um, uh, kind of people writing messy code that just uh, cost too many op codes and, okay. and things like that. Mm -hmm. right. So this kind of pay for your own execution uh, is actually a useful construct to meter third party development in an open way in a large persistent storage. Mm -hmm. uh, and this combined with the, with the memory sort of interaction model between smart contracts and the underlying kind of state I mean, it's a little bit problematic uh, for blockchains in a public way because, um, I mean, you end up with, it just doesn't scale very well. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are many tricks we have learned through the <coughs> development of Beam Online which map very, very well onto the concept of sharding as people have been using it in a, in a blockchain. So mm -hmm. we, we think we can get a little bit easily around the, the scalability problem by kind of leaning into sharding as a, as a method to do that. And then you have the ability for players themselves to compose elements of the world through writing smart contracts, uploading them, and creating infrastructure for the rest to do. As EVE players have already done, mm -hmm. you can talk, go to Awesome EVE on GitHub. You will see amazing right. amount of right. infrastructure right. created by thousands of people over the past mm -hmm. 20 years. Uh, and that's amazing. Uh, so this is another amazing way to do 
uh, similar things. Yeah. Uh, it's, so it's, that's number one. Yep. Okay. Uh, number two, uh, we do just do have the thing that uh, economic value is created inside a game like Game Online, mm -hmm. and the economic value has value outside of the game and inside of the game. And since day one, people have been selling the value uh, for real money mm -hmm. uh, on first eBay and now specialized websites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean the open sea of MMOs is called player auctions. Not that I'm promoting that. <laughs> uh, and uh, and us that make MMOs, we have to contend with this, mm -hmm. that there is real economic value. <laughs> it is traded on a gray market. It's against our end user license agreements. So we're in a way fighting behavior, which right. is out there. Right. And no matter what people say, that nobody wants that, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I have ample data There's to the contrary, happening. that right. uh, people are uh, engaging with it. Right. But the but the worlds are not set up like that. Like this is always a problem that MMOs are faced with. So uh, rather than constantly being fighting a war of attrition mm -hmm. uh, against us endlessly, I think it is interesting to live in a design space mm -hmm. where this is not a problem. This is uh, not a EULA violation. This is something that is just, I mean, any, anything goes. Uh -huh. And then you have the other problem of like, I am currently trusted to store fake spaceships in a database when they, when it kind of doesn't really have any economic value. And <laughs> I'm trusted to have procedures and we have internal right. affairs and God knows what inside CCP mm -hmm. to monitor employee uh, activity in the world, that employees are not cheating or using unfair advantage and yada, yada, yada. We're already doing this. And I think that's okay-ish mm -hmm. when it's not real economic value. But when you live in the world where it is a real economic value, mm -hmm. I think it actually does matter that we can say we can't really touch, touch anyone's assets mm -hmm. and we can't really, quote unquote, cheat in this world mm -hmm. because it's transparently out there. You could just see it legit. Mm -hmm. Here's the track record of everything that has happened. Mm -hmm. So when you imagine a world that is truly more composable by its player through smart contracts, where real economic value is not an afterthought and a problem, mm -hmm. it's a fundamental thing, uh, then blockchains do start to make sense. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. are obviously not the only solution. Of course. I mean, Second Life has run a, a pretty good racket on, on, on just uh, having an a sort of a fiat uh, right. in and out mechanism mm -hmm. and done the KYC <laughs> and the AML and everything involved in that. Mm -hmm. So that is po possible. <laughs> yeah. But there is another element of this uh, blockchain business, which is underestimated, which is the bottled up liquidity that exists in the ecosystem. And when you enter something in that is a uh, digital asset generator of sorts, then you can very easily see a world where if players are coming to you and say, "Hey, John Lai, give us a million dollars. We're gonna, we're gonna raise an army, and we're gonna build a star gate, and we're gonna right. lay down a new right. path, and we're gonna charge uh, <coughs> toll gates or something like You're that." You're getting John excited. Positive. I think John would be interested. Yeah, in this. Be positive about a while. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. exactly. Yeah. You will have yield, then you will have here, and here's so, right. uh, ROI curves, and 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 yeah. and pretty soon, you guys are investing in a digital infrastructure in a in a virtual <laughs> world, more in meaningful universe. than real life. Right. Right. Yeah, I think it's fascinating because I, I love the way you're thinking about it all and in the service of players and developers, right? And so I think like you know, kind of summarizing really quickly from from what I just heard, you know, turbocharging sort of third party development that's mm. already happening in the e ecosystem through smart contracts and then enabling the apps that people build to be composable with one another, right? So that's kind of you know accelerating that and making developers' lives easier and more powerful. And then the second part was um. Uh, just making sure that gray markets that exist today, which are largely unregulated and unpoliced and mm -hmm. all sorts of bad things might be happening to players who give money to someone, you know, on, on a on a, yep. on a Craigslist or something. It's actually part of the game. It's sanctioned, like there's support for that. And yep. it's 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 built into the design of the game itself, right? Yeah. Um, and, 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 and then, I mean, with all that said, mm -hmm. then, uh, I mean, it's very important. We're not doing any of that in email line. We've put mm -hmm. out that statement. Last year, not NFTs are not for TQ, uh, and 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 for everyone that does not want to go into that kind of wild west of right. of that craziness, right. then we have even line a bright future of its head, a very right. ambitious right map, and an extremely passionate dev team mm -hmm. that that uh, is off to kind of 
grow massively into the third decade to be online. <laughs> and I think offering these two kind of ways of doing this mm -hmm. are going to inform us even better of like, what is the maybe final form of all this combined right. uh, some decades right. later. Right. Uh, right. And I think it's a worthwhile result. Yeah. How do you, how do you think about what are the best parts of EVE that you want to bring into this new game? And then what are the parts that you definitely want? And it feels like you've already talked about the things that you want to change. So maybe we don't talk about that, but like one of the fascinating things I feel like is so much of this behavior is already happening in EVE Online today, right? So like there are already third party apps, there's already, you know, social systems being formed that sort of look like, you know, yeah. self-governing, you know, DAOs and so on. So talk, talk a bit about what you want to definitely preserve. Yeah. So, um, so EVE, when it shines, uh, like truly, is when it uh, allows for flexible organization at scale. Mm -hmm. uh, like a, a, a huge alliance in Evil Line, or even a coalition in Evil Line, with tens of thousands of people, mm -hmm. which have flexibly organized themselves into what is best described as a military hierarchy. Uh, and that is social composability. And, and, and nobody else can do that except humans. Mm -hmm. Monkeys can be flexible, but at a small scale. Insects can be at a high scale, but inflexible. Mm -hmm. Like you look at a beehive, it's coded in their DNA. You look at the army of monkey, there may be 152.8, I think is the numbers numbers. Uh, <laughs> really? Yeah, for humans actually, not for monkeys. Um, anyway, <laughs> but we have the ability to uh -huh. get insect scale like uh, human behavior in a flexible way, where it's not coded in our DNA. We can create ideas, we can create cultures, etc. Eve excels at that. So we definitely want to compete, co mm -hmm. keep that. Mm -hmm. Underneath all that massive structure is the fact that people have, on average, self-reported more friends if they play EVE Online than if they were not playing EVE Online. Hmm. Really? Yes. And, oh. and we've done deep studies on this, is that EVE, for kind of accidental reasons, is a friendship factory. Mm -hmm. Like it, it gives people lifelong, deep, deep relationships, mm -hmm. which they uh, rank as some of the the highest they have in their lives, right. like childhood friend kind of territory. And there is something about the intensity of the experience, the reliance on others, mm -hmm. the the trust that is formed through relying on others, both to do as they say, but also to catch you when you make a mistake. Uh, and, and these are the properties that uh, we must preserve, is the ability of the game to forge relationships into friendships, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this element where we allow social compatibility at scale. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and there are obviously kind of opportunities and dangers when you allow for such so much programmability on behalf of the player base. Because one of the downsides of programmability is that you can actually program trust away, where now everything is a transaction. You don't need trust I see. for mm -hmm. it to be. So it puts an enormous amount of burden on us to make the game in a world in a way, and this is kind of it's kind of a counter reaction. The more programmability we offer, the more chaotic and unpredictable the game has to has mm -hmm. to has to be the incentive structure expands like tenfold, yes yeah. like mm -hmm. you have to go in these opposite directions yeah. you give greater tools and now the world has to be even more dangerous so like counterintuitively you could almost say what we will eventually create is for lack of a better word going to be more hardcore <laughs> interesting and how do you on the, and on, on the topic of that um it feels like because assets um, could potentially be um, more freely exchanged between the virtual world and the real world, and therefore they feel like they have more, you know, they have real value. It feels like the stakes have also risen in the game, right? Yeah. And so it's almost like, uh, you know, when you play Diablo, you have hardcore mode, yeah. and then, you know, where you die and it's permadeath, you lose yep. everything, and yep. you can't That's play how I again. That's so. I always play that. I'm <laughs> always <laughs> hardcore. Look. Yeah, always lose on the same, this kind of spinning arcane yeah. balls. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> always dying for that. <laughs> <laughs> You're the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We all go into the other. Those are hard. And they're randomly generated as well. So you never know when, when the room you come into has one of those. Um, so is the right way to think about awakening basically higher stakes gameplay, basically? It's hardcore mode. 
or is, or is that an oversimplification? Um, yeah, I I think uh, in the case where we pull this off, I think it will be higher stakes, as mm -hmm. crazy as that sounds. Mm -hmm. It is already quite high, quite high stakes. Mm -hmm. um, but and the reason why uh, we are comfortable into going into that domain is because those high stakes bring about this crucible that creates friendships. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, absolutely. And, and it's just anything that's high stakes in life mm -hmm. relies more on trust, relies on more yep. on, on having strong relationships with people which are able and capable and say what they do and do what they say. So that's why we, we kind of have confidence in a way inspired by this, these 20 years of Evil 9 right. to, okay, how can we take it to 11? Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. here's a way to take it to a level. Yeah. And like just, you build the strongest relationship through shared struggles and shared adversity sometimes, right? And yeah. so, yeah. Um, I think the counterpoint is just, how do you make the game accessible to new people that are coming in for the first time there as well? Yeah. Because so so par part of the challenge of Evil Line on year 20 is that the game is a sprawl of yeah. systems. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot of stuff in system we have either created in the beginning or add it after the fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at it in its totality, uh, you can almost see there's a way to factor down the complexity and still increase depth at the same time. But that's only ha that's only possible when you look at 20 years of total development onto Eve. It's very hard to do that with Eve itself hmm. because, I mean, it's, it's transforming a lot of complexity. Uh, but from all that, it, it, it's, 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 it's not hard to see with clarity how you could factor down complexity and increase depth at the same time. I see. Mm. So it's both simplifying the game, keeping the best of what you've learned over the last 20 years, and at the same time, raising the stakes. So. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. kind of going deeper and, and, uh, and, and, and more focused. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and the emergence, kind of the experience that emerges like that has this kind of sort mm -hmm. of deep survival properties to it, uh, the, the, which we're kind of leaning into. It's very exciting. I think it ties back to the real world. You know, when I hear all of this, it's like the stakes get higher, but real life has stakes, like, and there's more yeah. layers to it. And, you know, people get married by playing MMOs for yep. their whole mm -hmm. life in yep. 20 mm -hmm. years. Like that's a that's more than a friendship. That's a that, you know, yep. that's a bond. Yep. And I think that with um, games that allow for more, I guess, stakes, call it financial stakes, call it time. Right. Um, there's a potential where, you know, there's more bad behavior. There's but there's also the potential. You know, stakes might always seem like negative because you're like it's humans are loss adverse. You don't want to lose it all. People are so concerned. Right. What if they're cheating you? You know, you like, yep. but but they but there is a, a beautiful yep. side of high stakes, you know, yep. like interactions yep. where totally. the bonds get even tighter. There's yep. even more friend circles. There's even more yep. lasting. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You, you could argue that's why um, like the souls like genre has expanded over the last few years. Right? Yep. People value they value doing well when what happens when you die is that you could potentially lose all of the souls that you spent yep. the last, you know, two or three hours grinding. Mm -hmm. right? and so, yeah. And it's actually, uh, I mean, I've played <coughs> Souls games kind of out of necessity. I, I've never really loved them. Uh -huh. I, I feel my agency is so limited. Mm -hmm. But as soon as Elden Ring came out with the open world component, I felt a lot more agency and mm -hmm. I, I love Elden Ring. Yes. But I, I <laughs> didn't really like love Dark Souls. Mm. I, I, I was kind of just for the academic of playing it, uh, but like, my God, the ability to kind of right. self-direct yourself yep. into the difficulty sort of mountains that are all over the game. Yep. But Th then you have agency. <coughs> Did you immediately run towards like the, the dragon and the troll that could kill you with one hit? Just yeah, of course. I, <laughs> did, did all that. Oh, I was going to ask, <laughs> did you go to the, the, and this has been patched out, but the area where you can kill the frog people that drop the highest volume, like within three weeks, very similar to how you said within the first three months, the battleships were born in mm -hmm. other ring. I had to not watch because within the first uh, three weeks, people figured out the spot where you can farm. Um, yeah, for, I, for, I, for I, the most souls. And it reminded me of the cargo ship story that, that you yeah. told about. Yeah, the frog people place. I went there. Yeah. I, it was pretty <laughs> late in my playthrough, and I did a lot of it, and it didn't feel great. Right, and I, I, I <laughs> yeah. almost wish I didn't see that, and I wish yeah. I didn't that didn't happen, and it, it took yeah. me yeah. out of and, it. And it just felt like morally challenging, yeah. and yeah. and especially I, I it must be inspired by Hyperion, 
uh, Hyperion Cantors by Dan Simmons, there is a level in one of the short stories in the beginning, which are a little bit like that frog level kind mm -hmm. of level. It must be inspired by like, mm -hmm. I, I would love if somebody could confirm that. Mm -hmm. oh. Like somebody at From Software, was that <laughs> inspired <laughs> by uh, the, 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 the kind of the the the, the uh, lightning yeah. tree planes in in well, Hyperion. Someone will comment. We'll we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get we'll, that back. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll have to outsource that uh, that that Twitter sphere, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get a comment. Um, one one last question in awakening, and then um, I think we're coming up in time here. Um, how do you think about uh, onboarding <coughs> when it comes to the blockchain game? Because that's I think long been considered one of the biggest challenges. Of just like you need to set up a wallet and transfer money in. And yeah. there's all these things you need to learn about like OpenSea and the marketplaces and everything. So how, how do you, and then on top of that, you also have a very deep and complex game. So yeah, how do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, we, we I mean, have been developing this for a bit over a year now. Mm -hmm. We have done a lot of user testing on our onboarding and generally, I mean, get pretty high marks on it. The uh, it, we're, we're assisted by the fact that obviously everything in the EVIP is a sci-fi experience. And there is a way to give all these kind of elements a more like a sci-fi feel where they feel more like a natural mm -hmm. part of a world mm -hmm. rather than some kind of imposters into an experience where it doesn't really fit. Mm -hmm. So we are leaning kind of heavily into the fact that we're making a sci-fi experience and some of this stuff is kind of sci-fi. And if you just get kind of the user interfaces and the font and all that, it just looks and feels a lot cooler. Mm, interesting. That's a and, good point. And, uh, I mean, some of the stuff that's out there is a little bit kind of programmer arty, I, I would say, uh -huh. being a programmer myself. And when you have like artists and UX <laughs> people work on these things in the context of a sci-fi game, the outcome is just a, a lot more coherent. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, I think that those are kind of our our strategies. It's to lean into into the into the into the lore of the mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of what that you said, sense. like uh, you, have, you have a quote that really stuck with me. It's like, we've been doing for 20 years what people wish to do today. And you have the universe that mm. you can build upon that has familiarity with, um, you know, it's been out there. So yeah. the way you can onboard through it is like, this exists, like this, mm -hmm. these yep. virtual worlds, yep. they exist. You don't yeah, have right. to guess or think and squint your eyes to see yeah. it's right there. Yeah, it's, it's even like, I mean, EVE Online has wallet, there are multiple currencies in it. I mean, how they are acquired from a Plex to an ISK mm -hmm. to loyalty points. I mean, these are things we deal with uh, all day long. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, it's obviously an ever, it's an ever struggle of just make good user experiences and make them intuitive yeah. and, and whatnot. Yeah. I'm not saying we, we are magically going to fix all the relatively crappy UX that's currently on offer. Yep. But I, yep. I think we have yeah. an opportunity to... Uh, to do it in a different way that uh, yeah. might inspire different feelings about it. Yeah, I love leaning into the law. I love the um, taking all of the 20 years of sort of UX design experience and then mm -hmm. channeling that towards sort of solving some of the issues of, of, of blockchain gaming today. Um, so we have a bunch of, um, we have many listeners um, on this pod who are startup builders themselves and entrepreneurs and many of them are building games. Um, do you have any words of wisdom or advice that you could share with your fellow entrepreneurs who might be setting off on a journey, you know, many that you went on many years ago? Yeah, I mean, I would maybe say like um, what you end up building, especially if it involves uh, other people um, uh, building it with you. Uh, you. You will have these challenges, like I talked about the time story. There are many other stories where Eve and Eve players have presented us with a challenge. And we have often kind of used intuition about like taking a call. We, no, yeah, we're we're not gonna do what is maybe short term economically seems wiser, but it just seems like this is more in line with the principles of what this world should be. And just not being afraid of 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 being true to that. And if you have intuition about like this feels like the right thing, even if it, on a sensible level, it doesn't really add up. It's just like really lean into that, and then the outcome will be more consistent. If you if you take these challenges and these kind of unexpected elements that come up, find a way to 
to use like a consistent kind of stream of thought through it and then what will become the outcome will be a, a, a more kind of holistic than if you're always trying to optimize for the next quarter. I think that's beautifully said and I think can only be set. It has a lot more weight coming from someone that's been building mm -hmm. and has had to probably have been challenged. Uh, the challenge has been a 20 year, a near 20 year journey to always remember the, the through line of it all. Right. Yeah, yeah, and sure. I mean, we have, we have stayed off the path in all crisscrosses. I mean, I think often we have done the, the right thing and often we've also done the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's usually always this dynamic. Like the, there is what is intuitively feels right. Mm -hmm. And there is the fact that you also live in a world that right. has a lot of uh, other things to consider. Yeah. Mm. They, say, they say life is just a series of small decisions that compound over time. Yes, so. that's exactly yeah, what it is and how you yeah. make those decisions matters a lot right right well it's a beautiful Strength. game a beautiful universe of like kind of a it, i'm i can tell just through you speaking about it that like i want to see a 30 year eve a 40 year eve yep. and it's uh clear <laughs> that there's you know still a very clear beating heart at the center of it all that like mm -hmm. i'm just uh, i can't wait for you to imagine the world that you might have um dreamt about when you were 27 come to yep. you know new manifest itself in new ways and in, in ways yeah. that can still surprise you because I've, you've seen a lot of sh sh you know, yeah, like, you, you've seen a lot of uh, stuff in this virtual world and, yes. and to stay still optimistic it's um it's it's yeah. encouraging to to me and to yeah. hear yeah yeah and we're very excited about uh project awakening yeah. and i think if um listeners want to learn more about it they can go to the website yes is that right yep it's projectawakening.io yeah projectawakening.io there's a email list sign up there um, I mean, we won't be maybe posting a lot of updates initially, but uh, okay. as the as the months progress, there will be news. Stuff. Excellent. Well, this has been fantastic, and you know, thank you, thank Helmar, you. for sharing all of your insights with us. Yeah, yeah. 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 thanks well, for having me. We'll, we'll do a check in on GDC number twenty three for you, or yeah. twenty whatever <laughs> at that point next year, and we'll, yeah. we'll see where it's at. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right, thank you for awesome. the time. Thank, thank you. you.